All right, Milwaukee's 1029 The Hog. Over three decades of everything that rocks, we've got uh, for night three of three at the Northern Lights Theater at the Potawatomi uh, Casino tonight, Queensryche, and uh, special guest Don Dockin from Dockin fame. Don is sitting to my right. That would be your immediate left. What's going on, Mr. Dockin? Here we you are. Can help me sing some harmonies? Because you can't sing Dockin songs without harmony. It's not killing you. There we go. Now we can hear you. What's happening? Welcome back to Milwaukee, sir. Are we tuning up or what? Uh, tuning out. Tuning out? <laughs> That's what I hear. No, yeah, well, it's really for me. We, we were, uh, no, it's nice. You know, Milwaukee is, uh, I was telling the guys in Reich last night that I was talking to my promo people, and, and the Dockham, Dockham broke out of Milwaukee. Breaking the Chains got its first ad in Milwaukee and went to heavy rotation, and that's what got the record to spread through the country. It started in Milwaukee. Wow, so we can take credit for all the success. Yep. And the Breaking the Chains. Um, they just emailed me, and, and my guy, Barry Lyons, was, was the guy promo guy from Milwaukee. says, don't forget, Milwaukee's where it's all, where it all started. Without Milwaukee, you guys probably would have been flipping burgers by now. I said, that's right. We started in Milwaukee. That's where the album broke. Do we get complimentary rides in the Jets now? or If you want. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm on the bus now. I was take we were taking the, the jet, but uh, it was kind of spooky. You know, this weather we're having. Oh God, yeah. So my pilot goes, "Okay, we'll fly here and we'll fly there." And it was like, you know, the windshield was icing up. I was sitting in the cockpit, and I don't know. It gave me the creeps a little bit. What have you been doing I, since uh, these last three days in town? Any any just scenery? Just chilling. Yeah. No, it's too cold. And um, you know, we have a new docking album coming out. Lightning strikes again in May. So I have to finish the graphics and the special thanks and blah, blah, blah. I just uh, finished the record. You know, and people have been waiting for it for three years. And for three years is a long time, you know, waiting yeah. for a new record. So I said, well, it's finally done. In fact, I brought you, if you want, I brought you a song later. We can play. I have one song from the album no one's ever heard. So if you want to spin it, you can. Yeah, we'll spin it. little test. Yeah. And that people call up and say that that blows, then we'll know that I made a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to be said. But <laughs> solitary. Now is that uh... solitary is my solo record? Okay. Yeah, that's a whole different departure. It's not like Don Dockin up from the ashes. It's it's all acoustic, and a lot of famous people. Uh, it's funny I say famous people in my world that people pr- go who who. But you know if, if you watch CSI, uh, that's a you know, that crime show in Vegas. You mm-hmm. know the, the the composer for that show, John M. Keen, did all my arrangements. Tony Franklin played bass, who played Robert Plant, Alex Acuna, Gary Ferguson, the famous drummer. A lot of famous session people, Michael Thompson, played on my record. And we just got together, and I just basically wrote songs on a guitar, and there were poems I put to music, and I just gave the music to all these people and said, do what you want to it, you know, just make it sound beautiful. Wow. So it's just like an album of just acoustic and piano and strings and... I say people Getting don't, out of the box a little bit. I go, don't put it in your car on the way home. You might fall asleep. <laughs> it's very mellow because the docking album is very heavy. All right, so Lightning Strikes Again, again. comes out in uh, the spring, I believe. Yeah, in May. And, and that's uh, it's like very retro. It sounds like cross between Tooth and Nail and Back to the Attack. Okay, now Wild Nick Brown back in the fold. Yeah, yeah, everybody's in the fold. Uh, there's rumors. He w- he went out with Nugent for a little well, bit. Well, yeah, he's always in docking. I mean, he just, when we're not touring, he plays with Nugent. Right. And then... Uh, we work it out. I talk to Ted, and I say, okay, when are you going out? And then I'll book the docking tour around it. And oh, wow, Mick cool. needs to work because he spends money like crazy at the casino, so he needs more money than me. Cause. How does uh, how does Ted warm up to, uh, okay, he's got the nickname Wild Mick Brown, and I've right. seen that firsthand quite a few years oh, back. Oh, yeah. How does uh, Ted, does he like reel him in? Does he give him the green light to go ahead and Honestly, do yeah. what Mick does? I think it's great. You know, I'm pretty laxed in the docking organization. I'm just like, do what you want to do, and that's your, that's your trip. Ted's got kind of a zero tolerance thing. It's like either killing or trying to kill, you know, and that's it. You know, he, if you want to go out and shoot a deer, then he's he's down with that. But, you know, he doesn't allow any too much excessive partying and, and you know, it's a no drugs, no nothing tour. You know, he he's a very serious guy. And But Ted doesn't go on the bus. He flies everywhere. And uh, and Mick, you know, I think it's good for him to be on the bus. Keeps him out of trouble, as he yeah. says. So when Mick sees you after X amount of months on the road with Ted, he just right. gives you a big bear hug saying, thank God I can drink again. Yeah, we go to the bar and we go, how you been? So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but Mick's mellowed out. He, he says he's wild Mick Brown, but, you know, he chills pretty much. Now, we get older. Yeah. You get older and, you know. That's something that, uh, you know, average people don't realize about Rockstar. Oh, man, I saw him years ago and he did this, X, you know, A, B, C, and D. And it's like, yeah, but you got to realize he's twice the age now he's got mortgage payments just like you do and family and yeah, kids exactly. but you want to be like kevin i mean look at kevin i mean kevin last time i saw him he looked great you know we played a, a quiet riot docking show this oh, that's right a couple months ago and then i hear kevin passed away and you know 
you can't do that stuff at 52 and ex- expect not to have some repercussions. Yeah. yeah that's, that's sad. That's he was a, a big loss guy. there. He was such a nice guy to oh, hang Oh, yeah. With. Ken was so cool. And if you didn't know that he was Kevin Dubrow from uh, Quiet Riot mm-hmm. and you were just sitting next to him, it would be, oh, this is a funny dude sitting next to yeah, me. Yeah, he wouldn't very, say, I'm a rock star. You know, no, none he of that. was very funny and very, uh, yeah, he was very witty. And, you know, we kind of grew up together. Kevin and I grew up in the Hollywood scene in 70. We did a show once. It was uh, it was the farewell show of uh, Quiet Riot with Randy Rose. He just joined Ozzy. Wow. So the, it was a place called The Starwood. It was uh, Van Halen, Quiet Riot, and Doc. And we all played in the same bill for two nights in Starwood. Get out of here. All three of us, Quiet Riot hadn't broken out yet. Ben Halen just got their deal, and um, and Randy was leaving. What was the ticket on that show? Just to oh, make me sick. It was expensive. It was like 20 bucks. Tw- you know? Okay. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> it, so was it was like 79. 70, I was going to say 78. 78. And so we all played together for two nights at the Starwood. And, uh, and it was funny because I was talking to Eddie, you know, during Monster Rock Tour. I said, wow, I just think we used to play the whiskey together and the Troubadour. And we played lots of shows together. And then here we were playing stadiums from 100 people 10 years later. Unbelievable. 78, and then also it was 88, and we're doing 100,000. And I said, wow, the world changes. Who huh? else was on that bill? Kingdom Come. Kingdom Come, Scorpions, Van Halen, Metallica. And you guys. Yeah. Wow. Metallica went on before us, and I begged every day for them to go on after us because they just killed us. <laughs> was that the Masters Tour? Or? Yeah, Master Puppets. Yeah. So, or no, Justice for All. And... Um, it just was hard because, you know, Dawkins Dawkin and, and Metallica's Metallica. But they came out there and they had a really great attitude. You know, they hadn't broken humongous th- yet in, in uh, they had their core. the States. But they came on, they had their core, but they came on stage and just destroyed everybody. They had that no prisoners mentality. And we just come off an 18-month world tour. Wow. We'd done like ACDC, Priest, Aerosmith. We've been out for 18 months. And then they said, okay, you're going home. Oh, this thing called Monsters Rock. You want to go and do that? And and they told us how much we're going to make, how many people. I said, yeah, but we were pretty toast by then. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's the tour that kind of unraveled Doc, and we just kind of imploded. We are just burned out. Same story with Guns N' Roses. They toured and toured and toured and toured and toured, and you just fall apart. If you're just joining us, it's Don Dockin, obviously front man and founding member of Dockin, uh, in, t- in town tonight with Queensryche at the Northern Lights Theater. Uh, it's the third and final night. He's going to do a little acoustic jam for us, but uh, would you compare, um, and we're just going to bring this up really quick and get it out of the way because it's like the number one question. I'm sure you're tired of it. Um, compare the beef between you and George uh-huh. Lynch. Would that be comparable to what Dave and Eddie recently apparently put aside? Yeah, probably. You know, I mean, George. When George, uh, when I called him and flew him to Germany to start the band, I had a record deal. I'd written the album, and I needed a guitar player and a drummer. I got Mick to come to Germany. He said, well, "How about George?" I said, "He's a great guitar player." I I'd played with those guys in a band called The Boys in L.A. But it seemed like from day one, before we even you know got hit our first show, you know, from just the day one we started working together, we were always very a lot of tension, a lot of tension from day one. And I thought, well, if we get successful and get money and you get your mansion and everybody would be happy and everybody would chill out. But it didn't work that way with George and I. It just got worse and worse and worse and worse. But I think it was just like a lot of drugs, a lot of drugs, a lot of drinking, you know. And uh, I wasn't doing that drugs and stuff. But, you know, they do whatever they did and mm-hmm. I'd take a Valium to escape <laughs> it, you know, and go to my bunk. So it just was a, just very – him and I, I think he got two people trying to be the leader of a band, I guess it was, were button heads. It was like David and, and Eddie. I mean, even when toward the end where I said I was leaving the band, I remember Eddie Van Halen and uh, Rudolf Schenker and and several people went to George's room and said, you know, what's up? You guys are like just almost duking it out on stage. And and Eddie said, hey, you know, I I didn't get along with David Lee Roth, but for that hour and a half you're on stage, you know, you do your job. The fans are there. Don't don't wash your dirty laundry in public. And he told me. Something I don't understand as a fan because you guys are getting paid to party. I understand there's the whole... You know, there is the work behind it. There's the business behind it. And uh, but when you do you guys ever pull each other inside, aside and say, you know what, dude, what are we doing? Well, not to 95. We I found this. out a blessing. It's yeah. a blessing. It's a gift. When we got back together, in 95, we went on tour again, went to Japan. Same stuff. Same old baggage showed up. And I pulled George aside one day and I said, you know, what what is it that you just, you know, are so unhappy with, you know, playing with me? And I said, what's the problem? And he, and he turned around and he pointed to our back drop where my logo was and he said he points to the doc logo and he said that's the problem and I went oh well I can't change that I guess because the band was called doc yeah he wanted we, it to be Lynch 
Well, maybe we were called the Fug Muggers or something like that. It would have, I don't know. He, he said, some, you know, like, the more famous we get, the better we, the harder we try. You get more famous. I said, no, we all get more famous. We're all four-way split. We all dollar for dollar. But he always had an issue, I guess, that the more famous the band got, I was on the covers of the magazines, and I'm doing the red carpets, and I'm at the Grammys, and it seemed to just bug him. But, wow. you know, that was a long time ago, and I see him. We're friends. We talk. And uh, oh, they, cool. they always call me. Every year they call me. How about a doctor reunion? I said, you, I gave you the price. Just, you know, you're missing a couple zeros. And if you <laughs> come with those zeros, we'll talk about it. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to play a tune here. We need a. Yeah, well, are we? I don't know. Check. I just woke up, so. Well, good morning. I have no headphones. You guys have any headphones, huh? There should be a set over there. 